but let's just uh, start this uh, third uh, webinar of the uh, series of Chrome 6 webinars, uh, explaining to you our project, but also all the information that we gain by studying Chrome 6 abnormalities. Can I have a second slide, please, Eliana? Yes. Today, I'm, after a brief introduction, where in which I will give a recap of the first two webinars, um, the, we have the following topics to discuss. First, uh, AFCA will explain to, to you what the health-related effects are of terminal 6 Q deletions. Then I will tell you about the results that we got from the survey that we did amongst parents to ask them for tips uh, on, on what helped them in their life with a child with a chromosome 6 disorder. Um, Eliana will talk about how to take part in the chromosome 6 project for those of you who are not familiar with the project yet. And then, of course, as usual, we'll, we will um, end with uh, some general information uh, about our crowdfunding and uh, a goodbye. And then after that, we will have our session, a private session with parents. So to give a very short uh, summary of our previous uh, webinars, and you can also always look at the webinars because they are available at our website. So you can have an, an, an look at them for more details. But the aims of this webinar series is to keep you informed, informed about the project, uh, about new developments, to create awareness. So for rare chromosome disorders and especially for rare chromosome 6 disorders and for this project and to ask for your support to take part in the project, but also um, um, help us with, with crowdfunding because that's crucial for the project. Without your help, we can't do this. Now, this is the project team. It's a long list of people and you can see the pictures over there. Um, I showed you this slide before, and it's just to show you that within the Netherlands, in the UMCG, so in Groningen, we have a dedicated team for this project. Most of the people work part time for the project. Some do it in their spare time because we keep the, we, we try to do to keep the costs as low as possible to keep this project running. Next slide, please. The aim of the Chromosome 6 project is to have more information available for families on the effects of chromosome 6 aberrations on the health and development of their child. So that's a very general aim, but it's a very important aim. Um, and why is this so important? Because if you have more information on natural history and comorbidities in these rare uh, disorders, you can empower families, but also doctors. If doctors have more information, they, they can improve the surveillance of their patients. Um, and of course, in the end, that will result in improvement of quality of life. Next slide. It is a project for parents by parents. It was initiated by parents. It's supported by parents. Parents give the information of their child and other parents benefit from that information. We recruit our, our families via social media. We collect information directly from parents and we have shown in a publication that is really is reliable information that we get from you. That you really can Get, give a good description of what the effect of chromosome 6 abnormalities is. We use micro reports, and uh, uh, Eliana was a little bit more about that. We have developed a very sophisticated automatic analysis of all the collected data so that we will be able to give back the information to you in a personalized way. So it's, it's, it's information that is really based on the aberrations found in your child. Uh, and now we are working on developing the interactive web page. We are well on the way to do so. And then if it's ready, if you go to the website, you can just type in what aberration has been found in your child and the system will automatically give the information that's in, available within the database and really direct it towards the aberration of your child. So with the information that you get is uh, suitable for your child. So you can really see, okay, this is what I can expect. It's not that everything that is present in the database will also be present in your own child, but you'll have a very good description of what you may expect. Next slide. So that was the introduction and the summary of the previous two uh, webinars. So now I would like to give the floor to Afke, who is going to talk to you about the health-related effect of terminal 6 Q deletions. Afke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Connie. Yes, so I will be talking about studies we performed uh, on the individuals with terminal 6Q deletions. First of all, uh, something about what is a terminal 6Q deletion. 
Uh, so the word terminal in this um, uh, context means uh, that it includes the ends of the chromosome. Um, and uh, uh, so um, we looked at the uh, chromosome aberrations of the uh, Q arm, the long arm of chromosome 6, and then uh, especially at chromosome band uh, 6Q27 uh, and 6Q26. And also in a lower figure, you also see another schematic overview of chromosome 6, and then the red box is, was the uh, area of interest for the terminal 6Q deletion study. So if we go to the next slide. Then, uh, so we studied the phenotypes of th these children with a terminal 6Q deletion, and the phenotypes are is everything, including the medical issues, developmental problems, but also behavioral characteristics. And um, uh, we did this uh, to uh, uh, gain more insight in the problems of the children with the terminal 6Q deletions to uh, provide this, um, well, essential information to parents. And also we um, uh, distilled um, uh, recommendations uh, for uh, screening and testing for the children from this information so that um, also the, well, the care is improved for these children. And we published this uh, information in, a, in an article. Uh, this was published last year and is open access available. Um, so here uh, is all the information. Uh, and today I will uh, um, uh, discuss some of the highlights. So what did we do? Uh, we made a clinical description of all the individuals we knew with the terminal 6Q deletion. Uh, these were at that moment 93 individuals, of which 35 uh, were participants in the chromosome 6 project and 58 were uh, patients described in the medical literature. Uh, so on the right hand side, you see a figure with, all, uh, with on, the, uh, on the top, you see uh, chromosome 6 and the chromosome bands uh, 6Q26 uh, and 6Q27. And uh, below you see all the, all the individuals, all the deletions, um, a schematic overview. And in uh, uh, all the black bars represent individuals uh, participating in a chromosome 6 project and all the gray bars are the in uh, the deletions of the individuals um, uh, from the literature. Um, and uh, as you can see on the right hand side, there all their deletions stop at the end, since the end of the chromosome is included. So uh, uh, one, one breakpoint of the deletion is the same uh, for each individual and the other breakpoint is unique. Also, uh, we looked into uh, deletions which um, uh, well, so-called interstitial deletions, so they are not until the end of the chromosome, but they are in this region, but they are a bit smaller. Uh, and they are not shown in this figure, but there were three chromosome 6 project participants and also eight described from the medical literature. In this, uh, they are included in the, in the, in the article, but um, uh, uh, in this webinar, we will, I will focus on the terminal deletion, so when the end of the chromosome is included. Next slide, please. And in here you see the same figure again, as you saw on the last slide, but now you also see um, uh, vertical bars in all kinds of colors. And this has to do with the grouping of the individuals. So next. Yes, and um, what we did is we tried to group all these individuals uh, based on uh, the genes uh, within their deletion. And we focused in this uh, one on the genes uh, which are known or are expected uh, to have an effect when they're deleted. And these are called so-called uh, so haploinsufficiency genes or HI genes. So if you uh, look at the list, I gave all the genes a different color uh, corresponding with the figure. And then you can see how many individuals also had a deletion of that gene. So you have to start in the figure on the right hand side on the smallest deletions and then uh, go to the left. And then you can see the more deletion, uh, the more HI genes are included in the deletion. Um, uh, a, a new group will start. Uh, so for example, if you go to the next. Then uh, now you see a red box 
um, of um, uh, demarcating a group of individuals for which all the DLL1 gene was included, but the uh, AFDN gene was not included in the deletion. And based on that information, um, well, we try to group the individuals and also compare them. So what did we learn in, in, in general from this, from, uh, from um, studying these terminal six deletions? We learned that for the total group, um, there was a very common phenotype. So we looked into all these, these subgroups, as I just described, but we didn't see that many big differences between the subgroups. I will come back to that later, but what we mainly saw was that there was a common phenotype for all these deletions. So there were a, couple, a lot of characteristics that were seen in all these individuals, but um, um, so in larger deletions and in smaller deletions, um, but not all the characteristics were seen in each individual. So it was highly variable. So in this uh, pink box, you can see all kinds of characteristics that were seen in about one third of the individuals. So a lot of individuals had a small head, some had vision problems, feeding problems were seen very often. Um, and also um, uh, uh, many neurodevelopmental problems. So for example, brain abnormalities were, were seen very often. Uh, some uh, individual or a lot of individuals had seizures um, and also balance problems were often seen and most had the developmental delay. And then and the next, there's a list of uh, characteristics that were seen in a smaller group, still about one in four had one of the uh, had uh, um, one in four had uh, these characteristics, um, um, but it, but not everyone um, had these. And also these were seen in larger deletions and in smaller deletions, um, including heart defects, um, 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 but also um, anal abnormalities and um, uh, uh, certain uh, behavioral abnormalities. Go to the next. And here are some clinical photographs of uh, some individuals. And these individuals all had quite a large uh, deletion. Uh, and uh, as you can see in here, uh, most had uh, hypertellurism. So their eyes were, uh, um, there was a more, more space between their eyes. Uh, they had some a bit of dysplastic ears. So the shape of the ears was a bit different. Uh, and one of the individuals in this photograph had a cleft lip. Um, uh, but there were only three in the whole group of, of 93 who had a cleft lip or a cleft lip palate. So we looked into um, why, um, uh, for, so what we saw was that uh, most of the individuals, uh, their phenotype was, was very comparable and we couldn't really say uh, like, um, okay, these small deletions, uh, they have this kind of phenotype and then the larger deletions get these extra and we see these extra characteristics. So, so it was all a bit the same for the whole group. Um, and then uh, we started to study more into the genes within the deletions and then we found this uh, study. And this is a study on a gene which is very um, uh, towards the terminal end of the chromosome. So uh, I... Um, I try to draw it schematically and on the right hand side it's very much towards the end of the chromosome. So it's included in almost all of the deletions and individuals who have a variant in this um, uh, uh, gene. Uh, so a mutation in the gene and they they only have a, a well a coding variant in, within this gene. They have a very comparable phenotype to the to all the patients of uh, uh, we are we have included in the project with a deletion. So if we go to the next slide, then here you can see this pink box of, of characteristics that were seen in individuals with the deletions, which were seen in uh, about one third of the individuals. And in blue, you see all the characteristics that were also seen in these individuals who only had a very small um, uh, variant in this gene. Uh, and this was very, very comparable. So it might be that uh, the explanation that uh, the individuals with the deletions all had a very comparable phenotype is due to this gene, that this gene plays a, a very important role. And um, 
has a big effect on the phenotype. And since, since it is very close to the end of the chromosome, it's affected in almost all of the deletions. So therefore, this is some uh, a bit like the the basics, uh, the basis of the of the phenotype. And then when the deletions become much larger, then we did see some uh, differences. And I would like to go a bit in uh, to detail on that. So in here you see uh, a figure on uh, the level of uh, development. And uh, in the leg uh, legenda, you see that in green, uh, they, they are, these are the individuals uh, um, with a normal development. And uh, in uh, the darkest red is the, are, the, are the individuals with uh, the most uh, severe developmental delay. And um, you can see in here, if you uh, have a look at the, at the figure that um, uh, on the right hand side of the blue bar, there are individuals who have a normal development and on the left hand side, there, there are not. So when the deletion becomes larger, uh, the chance of having a, a normal development uh, becomes smaller and the, development, uh, the, the phenotype is more severe. Um, and uh, we again looked at uh, these so-called HI genes, um, like where could we um, see something like a border, like um, um, if this gene is included or is not included, but what does it make a difference? So we saw that about at uh, 7.1 uh, mega uh, basis, we saw that there was, uh, you could say, uh, if the deletion was smaller, then it's, uh, the phenotype was less severe than when the uh, uh, deletions were larger. So also in these larger deletions on the left hand side of the blue bar, we sometimes saw that individuals also had an optic nerve hypoplasia, coloboma, sometimes sleep apnea was seen and also cleft pellets were sometimes seen as well as anal atresia. Um, what's important uh, to um, uh, say here as well is that it, it's very uh, still also very low numbers. So some of these characteristics were only seen in, uh, in two or three individuals. Um, it could be that these are are also um, um, uh, could also be present in individuals with smaller deletions, but just due to the low numbers, we do not know yet. Uh, so it, it might still be a coincidence that we only found them in the individuals with larger deletions. Um, um, so therefore it's also, even though we have qu well, quite some information for these terminal 6Q deletions, it's still important to collect more data to get more insight into also these kind of characteristics, which were only seen in a couple indiv of individuals. Good. Go to the next slide. So we also made a, a table of recommendations um, for uh, individuals with uh, uh, terminal 6Q deletions, and we split it up in uh, deletions smaller than seven megabases and uh, deletions uh, larger. Uh, so for example, uh, for the vision assessments, um, uh, this should be done for um, each individual. And um, but also for the but for the individuals with the larger deletions, we also um, ask uh, uh, for attention for um, if there are colobomas or an, uh, optic nerve hypoplasia. Next slide. So for the take-home messages, uh, the terminal 6Q deletions, even though they may vary uh, very much in, in size and how, uh, how, how many uh, megabases they uh, are, um, uh, the, phenoty the phenotype is very uh, uh, common, uh, but highly variable. So um, um, all kind of different, uh, all the same characteristics are seen, but not each characteristic is seen in each individual. Um, and most likely this uh, common phenotype is um, due to the deletion of the DLL1 gene, which is at the very end of the chromosome, and therefore almost always part of the deletion. And we did see that some in the, uh, individuals with the larger deletions do show a more severe developmental uh, delay and also some additional features. Um, and then there's the fourth message, uh, which is always important that every child is unique. So, um, and especially in this group, um, uh, each child is unique and, and 
well, not all these characteristics mentioned here are seen in every child. Um, and, and through this, uh, this study, we learned a lot already. Um, so as I said, well, we, we could identify the DLL1 gene as a very uh, highly suspected gene of, well, the main cause of, of the phenotype. Uh, but um, also more information can really help us in uh, defining if also these uh, characteristics which were now seen in larger lesions uh, uh, two or three times, uh, maybe are seen uh, more often also in smaller deletions or if they really belong to the, um, the group of the individuals with larger deletions. So um, you helped us a lot. Um, and I hope uh, we can, well, work together uh, in the future to define this uh, phenotype even better. Then we go uh, to the. Thank you very much, Afka. Yeah. I don't see any questions in the chat. So if you have questions for Afka, you're allowed to to type them in. And if not, then I will continue to the with the next program point. I don't see any questions. Okay. So the next the next topic of today is uh, the tips that you gave us. So um, by the end of last year, I asked you please email us those tips that for you were life changing what really helped you in the, in 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 the support of your child and uh, so we asked what therapy medication equipment other things has been a life changer to you in regard to your child with a chromosome 6 aberration and then the number of responses was surprisingly quite low only four so maybe that's because you couldn't think of anything. And so I hope that with this presentation today, you may think, oh, but I have also something that I would like to share with the others. So please, if you have tips for us, email them. And then in next webinars, we can pay attention to them as well. So for now, I will show you what, what tips we got. Next slide, please. Um, once it was on medication, what's the situation? Was a child with a chromosome 6Q deletion? He had focal epilepsy, it was located in the right frontal cortex, which is a specific part of the brain. Um, and this resulted in ocular tics, so movements of the eyes, but also in behavioral problems, very challenging behavior. What happened is that in the end, the, the doctor prescribed CBD oil, known as cannabidiol. But it's registered in the Netherlands and also in countries in other European countries as APDOLIX. And it needs to be prescribed by a pediatrician. So it's not the usual cannabis oil. It's a very, very high quality stuff. And by giving him this medication, there were less ticks, so less ocular fast movements, and he was less agitated. It also improved communication and a better overall well being. So for this family, this really made a difference. It, he became a more accessible, more social uh, child, which is, of course, is very important in the, in the family. Now, there is, are some things to say about this medication. In the Netherlands, Epidiolix is registered as extra therapy in Dravet syndrome. Dravet syndrome is a form of epilepsy that can be very difficult to treat. So it, and, it's only, and then this medication is only prescribed when the patient does not respond to regular therapy. Now, it is known from studies that if you give, in a very severe epilepsy syndrome, if you give this cannabis oil, then it improves the frequency, it lowers the frequency of the convulsions, of the attacks. It improves mood, so there's a better uh, uh, behavior, better feeling of the child, and it also can improve cognition. So it has been shown in Dravet syndrome to be very helpful. And yes, if your child has epilepsy, which is especially the focal uh, forms, which is, doesn't respond well enough on the regular epilepsy medication, then you can try this, um, this cannabis oil, but you have to use the, the good one. You have to use this medication because it's more stable, it's better to dose, and the, the things that you buy uh, of the counter are not very good in quality. So never use non-registered cannabis oil. Use only when prescribed by your doctor, and I highlighted that because I think that's most important. Never use it without consent of your doctor. 
And if you have medication, always shake well before use. Because the cannabis is a little bit more heavy than the oil, so it will go to the bottom. And if you know, don't shake it, it will become stronger and stronger and stronger. And you can even get an intoxication. So that's very important. You also have to know it's very expensive. So if it's not reimbursed in your country, it costs a lot. And it may cause some side effects like drowsiness, dizziness, and also problems with your liver. So yes, it's not a miracle uh, medication, but it can be very helpful. But you have to, to do it together with your doctor if you want to start this. So you can suggest to your doctor if your child has epilepsy and also have these problems, this challenging behavior, then you can discuss this with your doctor. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, uh, another a tip for a parent on therapy. This is on occupational therapy. And this is what the, the parent wrote to us. Occupational therapy is incredible. I barely knew what OT was about before she started. And now I can't imagine where she would be without her wonderful therapist. I know a lot of children with, with chromosome 6 disorders who have occupational therapy. What is it? Well, occupational therapy focuses on the physical, psychological and social aspects of human functioning. So not only physical, so not only is your child able to walk, um, can it, can it um, fasten buttons or can it use a zipper? It's also about the well-being, the psychological well-being. So it looks at a child as an individual, as a whole. So not only the body, also the mind. What it aims for is it aims to enable individuals across the lifespan, so young children as well as adults, by optimizing their abilities to perform activities that are meaningful to them. Meaningful activities are also called occupations. So meaningful to them is not what is meaningful to society. So it's not aiming at you to your, your, the individual to be as productive as possible. That's not the aim. The aim is to be productive, to give a meaningful um, uh, a meaningful um, activity in your life that can be very important to you. If children come to my to my clinics, I always ask parents, do they have tasks in the household? And then they question me, why is it? Well, it's important to have your own task within the family can be very good for your self-esteem. And of course, then you have to give the child a task that a child can easily perform and they can be proud of because it's very good for your self-confidence. So it must be meaningful to them and feeling to do something is also meaningful to family, of course, is also helpful as well. Occupations may include activities of daily living. So make, uh, uh, make um, laying the table or making your bed or whatever. Work, vocation, play, education, leisure, rest and sleep and social participation. Of course, social participation is very important. Can I have the next slide? What an occupation, occupational therapist does is it first she, he or she first evaluates the individual's capacities and then they look to the environment, both physical, psychosocial, and then together looking at the environment and the child, what are the capabilities of the child, they help the individual to optimize their function and fulfill their occupational roles. So what's meaningful to them, help them to achieve that with the means that they have. Often they recommend adaptive equipment, special chairs, special beds, uh, a speech computer, assist, eh, also technology projects, products, and pro they also provide training on using these to help mitigate the limitations, the physical, psychological limitations they have and to enhance safety. Okay, so yes, an occupational therapist can do a lot for children, individuals with special needs. So if you don't have one yet, I re really recommend you to, to at least ask an, a, a, one appointment to see what he or she can do for you and for your child. Um, okay, then there were two tips on coping strategies. And I've called this, I don't know how to call it. First I said attitude, but it's not the right word. I think it's a coping strategy. How to cope with everything you go through when you have a child with special needs. Now one parent said, be open about it. Advocate for your child with all people within your close and extended extended circle, family, friends, school, work, neighbors, and connect with other families that can understand your struggles and celebrate the small big wins with you. This is a long sentence with a lot of messages in them. So I have 
split up in four, be open about it. You can't hide your child and you can be as proud of your child with special needs as you are proud of your other children. So they are who they are. They are unique. They, they, they are different, but it doesn't mean that, you, that they are less than other people. So you have to stand up for them and you have to say, OK, this is my child. This is what he or she can do. We have to deal with it. They have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. You have to deal with it. So I have to adjust. We, the environment, have to adjust ourselves to help the child and the individual. It's not the other way around. So advocate for your child and be open about it. And also, if you need help, be open about it. I can't do this myself. You have to help me. You have to give me the tools to help my child. It's too complicated for me. Ask. Connect with other families. That's so important because they have gone through this process. So they can give you tips and you're not alone. So if there is a parent support group, try to connect with them. And if you're OK, they come, come through this process. It can be so rewarding to help young families. So do that. Celebrate each and every win. Every small step forward is one step. Celebrate it. And I always also say always to parents, it's so helpful to have therapists who watch your child and he can see these small steps because in, in everyday life, sometimes you just miss these steps. It's so helpful if they can point out to you, look what she's, she or he is doing now. She couldn't do that half a year ago. So that's also a function of therapists, I think, to help you see what, what your child has achieved because that gives such so much power to you. Okay, next slide. Another, another parent, parent said, uh, sorry, I still put attitude here, but it's the wrong word. It's coping strategy. Don't borrow, borrow, borrow worry from tomorrow. We try really hard to make sure we're staying on top of everything, but we don't worry about what might happen until that thing actually happens. Because there is a chance it might not happen, and then we just spend a lot of stress worrying for nothing. So we try hard to live in the present and not worry about the what if scenarios. Now, this, of course, is a very, very, very important remark. And it's not only true for families who have a, a child with special needs. It's true in everyday life. How often, even myself, I worry about things that never happen. People suffer the most from the suffering they fear. That's the saying, and that's also true when you have such a child. And of course, so mindfulness, stay in now and then, enjoy what you have. It's OK. Do not be too well prepared. Of course, you have to be a little bit prepared, especially when your child grows up. You have to think, about, OK, where is my going? Where is my child going to live? Is there, is there a, a special house? Is there a special environment? Uh, sometimes you have to think a, a few years before it's time the child leaves the house about how I'm going to do that. But don't worry too much. Don't worry about the small things. You can't, you can't prevent everything. And try to embrace the unexpected. So if it ha happens, OK, you'll see. We'll see about when it happens. Have faith in your own talents to solve problems. And most of you already have learned a lot how to solve problems. So even new problems will be solved. If you can't do it yourself, there are always people around that can help you. You have been there before, trust me. OK, next slide. So this was what I could tell from the tips I got from parents. And I, I want to thank these parents from the bottom of my heart because it's very helpful to get these remarks and to pay attention to these very special aspects. So I'm very happy that, that you gave me this tip so that I could uh, give that to, to other parents. So now Eliana's turn and she's going to talk about, about how to take part in the Grown to Six project. Eliana, floor is yours. Yes. Um, yeah, so I will very shortly explain um, or go through all the steps you uh, need to do to take part in the project if you are not already doing so uh, and how you can contribute. 
So first of all, in order to participate in the chromosome 6 project, you need uh, the result of an array or microarray analysis. And um, this result is written in the array report. And this report describes the exact start and end point of your uh, child's deletion or duplication. If you do not have uh, such a report, you can request, request it your, from your healthcare professional. And usually that's a clinical geneticist or a pediatrician. And to make this easier for you, we have a template letter on our website, which you can download, uh, fill in with your details and use it to request uh, the report by your healthcare provider, or you can contact your doctor yourself. If you have already an array report, then you can just skip this step. Um, more information on how to read the array report yourself uh, can be found on our website. Professor Connie gave a, an explanation on reading array results in the previous webinar, and the recording is uh, on, the, on the website as well. Now, once you have the area report, you can go on our website, chromosome6.org, uh, and click on sign up on the right upper corner. And there you will find the sign up form uh, where you can fill in your name and email address so that we can reach you and you can then upload the area report. It is very important that the file you upload contains information on the start and end point of the deletion or the duplication of your child, because that's essential information that we need for the project. If you have the full genetic report, then please upload the whole file. Um, and if you have any trouble uh, uploading the file, then you can always email us and we, we can help you further. Before you submit your error report, you have to agree to our privacy policy, our privacy statement, and you can read the whole statement, uh, which is available in seven languages by clicking on it. Um, what it describes is everything you, know, you need to know about the project, what it does, how we are using the data and the way we are storing it. Um, so after you uh, agree with the privacy statement and you submit your error report, we will um, view it and review it. And uh, if you are el eligible to take part in the Chromosome 6 project, you will receive uh, an email with, with instructions on how to log into the, to your personal account, the Chromosome 6 account, through which you can access the Chromosome 6 questionnaire. And this email contains also a link you can set up uh, to, you can, through which you can set up a password for your account um, and also instructions on how to fill in the questionnaire itself. Um, please note that the email in this account uh, is an automatic email and you cannot reply to it. If you have any questions, you should always email us at chromosome 6 at umcg.nl. Now, once you have your area, your uh, account, you can log into the questionnaire and fill it in. And um, the link to access the questionnaire is in the automatic email with the account details, or you can also uh, access it through our website. Um, once you click on uh, on the uh, link to the questionnaire, then you will get a pop up asking how you would like to log in uh, and then you click on with chromosome six and then it will redirect you to uh, the login page when you can fill in the email through which you signed up and the password you set up uh, using the link in the email. Um, if you have not set up an email or uh, a password or you forgot your password, you can click on forgot your password and then you will receive an automatic email on setting up a new password and then you can log in. Once you have logged in, you can then access the chromosome 6 questionnaire, which consists of 13 chapters, which you can see here on the, on the right side, and a total of 132 main questions. And then most main questions also have sub-questions. Um, so good news, you don't have to uh, fill in the whole questionnaire at once. Um, every answer you provide gets automatically saved, so you can go back or log out and continue later. You can also check that yourself to make sure that the answers are saved. So once you log in, answer a few questions in the beginning, log out and log in again and see that your answers are saved just to make sure. And it is very important that you submit the questionnaire once you have answered all the questions. And the submit button is at the very end. So at the comments chapter, which is the last chapter, uh, you don't have to provide any comments, but you do have to click on submit because this is the only way we will be able to use the information you have provided in the questionnaire. Yeah, there's the submit button. If you have any questions uh, about signing up, about logging into your account or filling in the questionnaire or any other Chromosome 6 project related questions, please email us uh, and we will come back to you as soon as we can. This webinar is getting recorded, so this information will be found on our website, but there are also instruction videos currently in the website on how to take part.
and that was it from my side. Thank you very much, Eliana. Well, then we are nearly at the end at the end of our webinar. Um, I would like to see the next slide, please. Because, um, well, as I said in the beginning, we still need your help. Um, we are highly dependent on crowdfunding. Um, we are a dedicated group of researchers. You are a dedicated group of parents. And we have now the largest chromosome 6 database ever. So we're doing great work. And we are working on our dream, which is almost ready to have a detailed patient-specific information available directly on our website. So that's what we're working on. Can I have the next slide? I'm going to... Um, a bit fast because of we are almost at, uh, running out of time, but that is how you can can be involved in our project. You can participate by participating the inf by by giving us the information of your own child. You can also be involved in the International Chromosome Six Foundation. Um, you can be, become a, a ambassador for the foundation in your own country, and you can support us. Um, of course, financially, um, you can find this that can be done. Uh, how to do that can be found on our own website, but also at the website of the Chromosome 6 Foundation. The next slide, please. This is a, a slide of the Chromosome 6 Foundation. I already showed you is this in the first two webinars. If you want to more, have more information, please contact them at info at chromosome6foundation.org. They're happy to answer all your questions as well about the foundation. Now, how can you support us? As I already told you, we're dependent on crowdfunding. Next slide, please. And as in the, uh, please click on because I can't see the figures. Yes, just please click because I think there's an animation in that. It's great. Not another time. Yes, please. Thank you. So what I show you here is the money, uh, the, the the amount of money that we still need to come to our final product, to so the final program with the interactive website and we have calculated that we will need about 55,000 euro for that and since our first webinar we collected almost 5,000 euros so we're well on our way but we're not there yet so what I kindly ask you to do is scan this QR code share it with or, or make a photocopy of it share it with your family with your friends with everyone you know do some good work and please help us because we're doing our best, but we are mainly doing this in our spare time, voluntary. And if we want to have this ready soon, we really need some extra help. So that's my plea um, for you. Um, next slide, please. So just continue uh, with the next slide. Thank you. Now, now we will uh, continue with the other link with parents. So if you're a parent and you have been provided with this a private link where we will close this session. We will go to the next slide and leave it for a moment. So if you want to copy this information, you can still make a picture of it. But for now, uh, we go out of this session and go to the other session where we will answer questions of parents in a private environment. I want to thank you all for your attention and I hope to see you at the next webinar, which will be webinar number four. If you have suggestions for topics to be discussed in the webinar, please let us know and we're happy to do that. Bye-bye.